Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Beers and Bites, co-hosted by Chris Jordan of Fluency Security and Jeremy Murdishaw from 4 to 5, 24 by 7. This week's special guest is Glenn Penley, who is the Deputy CTO of Tenable. You're going to learn today not only about his powerlifting capabilities, but his company's ability to come out and help manage vulnerability risk uh, and many other types of solutions that provide these assessments from on-prem to cloud-based. You'll also learn a little bit about the acquisition of an OT company entity that they completed late in 2019. With that, please enjoy this session. And uh, so Glenn, welcome to our little experiment in beers and bites. And basically we just hang and bring somebody aboard to talk about uh, security and uh, drink some beers. Uh, Chris Jordan, Glenn, Mer Glenn, Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Marishaw, how do you pronounce it, man? I just say Marishaw. 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 I gotta get the T in there. And then we got our guest is Glenn Penley, and and my bigger guest is uh, I brought me um, Three Notch Brewery. I got uh, King of the Clouds, a juicy IPA, nice eight percent alcohol. So, nice. yeah. I, 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 now Glenn's right on the edge of Loudon. Actually, you're in Loudon, aren't you, buddy? I am. Yep. So you should be bringing me a vanish beer. What do you got? What do you got on your tap? I I have just Guinness right now. Cause All right. Guinness. I guess we're close enough to St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rocking the uh, the, Kona? the Kona Brewing Company uh, Big Wave Golden Ale at the moment. So cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. Cheers. So Al, are you going to drink? Is that Texas iced tea? What is that thing called? There you go. It, it, it's, it is a tea. So, <laughs> all right. A little whiskey in there. Well, you never know. Maybe Everclear or something like that. <laughs> eating you. I don't there you go. Everclear anymore. Oh, you kill germs. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Glenn, you are now, or you have been, the uh, deputy CTO at Tenable. I am, yes. And what does that entail? A lot of different things. I uh, actually just came back to Tenable about two weeks ago. I, uh, I like to say I, I took a little sabbatical. I uh, went over to Security Scorecard, was the CTO there for about six months. But um, missed I, I missed uh, Tenable. I was there for, you know, nine years, eight or nine years to start. And it just kind of felt like home. And, um, you know, it just... It was right. It was right for me. So I took a six month sabbatical and I'm back as the deputy CTO. And yeah, right now, I'm, you know, just, uh, you know, it's been two weeks. It's not like six months is that long, but uh, just getting up to speed and trying to help out across the company, especially in this kind of uh, weird time that we're currently in with the, yeah, it's, with the, it's absolutely bizarre. Yeah. About it. No doubt is about it. So how's the, uh, How's the crunch? You're not crunch. You have your own workout place, right? I d yeah. I, uh, so moved all of my powerlifting equipment into my new house. We moved last okay. year. Um, so I've got probably about $50,000 worth of gym equipment in my basement. And the problem yeah. is, is uh, my training partners, they're not allowed to come over. So yeah. like, there's only so much working out you can do, you know, like powerlifting and strength training by yourself. So. Yeah. So what uh, powerlifting is a, a part-time hobby of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, you look like you're in much better shape than I am at the moment, though. <laughs> I'm recovering from hip line, from knee surgery and hip sur huh? Waiting for the punchline, you know, the 12 ounce <laughs> curl or what type of powerlifting? No, 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 no. I mean, my my question is, uh, have you done comps and uh, what is your total? Yeah, I um. So I haven't done it in a while. Um, I have an 800 pound back squat, well, geared or raw, because it's two different totals. Geared, I have an 800 pound Your back choice. squat. I have 550 bench and 650 deadlift. Wait, wait. So right. now let's talk about the wife before. I know we're going to talk security, but let's talk about yeah. the wife's powerlifting. 
Yeah, I uh, so I was training my wife for a while, and she set the national record in the bench press for her age and uh, weight. So she was she weighed one thirty nine. She was 38 at the time, so the 35 to 40 age range, and she benched 225. Wow. So, nice. Now, she's, it's a little bit unfair because she's, like, super short and has these stubby little arms, so she's, like, little, and she has really flexible, so she has, like, a big <laughs> arch. But it, I mean, I tell her this all the time. <laughs> but her little arms are just, like, <clears throat> so, I mean. Like a little T-Rex kind of movement? Yeah. But, hey, it, it counts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the – the downside that I have, right, with these yeah. big long monkey arms, is I've got to push, you know, yeah. a good twenty inches before I can get it off my chest. That, we were, and I wear a thirty-eight sleeve, so. I uh, speaking we, of monkey, yeah. <laughs> we we were we were doing a meet at my in my house with my training partners last like July, um, and I ended up rupturing my bicep tendon. And, oh. Yeah, so I had to get screwed back on. So there's, I haven't, I just started really lifting heavy again, probably three months ago, because that that was not fun. Yeah, well, you have also a, a metal leg, so. I do have a metal leg. I <laughs> had my spine fused. I should probably stop doing certain things, but I'm an idiot, so just <laughs> just keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, dude. Have you ever trained with the uh, slingshot? Yeah, we have different slingshots, the different types, and. We actually have a real, real bench shirts and stuff. So like overload training is amazing to help. He, he has yeah. a career in insanity, uh, Jeremy. He was a Marine. Yeah. So it's just, it just runs in his blood. It, it never left him. Yeah. Eating, eating, <laughs> eating, all, eating all those crayons really did a number on me. So. <laughs> <laughs> so did you box when you were a kid too? I, I did. That was my first sport. <laughs> Boxing when I was five or six that was good for the brain anyway no. so we'll probably chop all this and throw it at the end we'll see yeah. what travis does, you know um you know travis not katie's editing all this stuff out hmm. <laughs> so we're we might have to do the front end again too because he, he tells me i do a terrible introduction anyways i see you're, you get a dog walking in the back yeah we we oh, might see how with jeremy <laughs> And so, I, I changed my camera angle today, so there's no dogs in my view, yeah. unless they walk right up here. It, and they will, and they will one day. So, so <laughs> on the security side, I mean, how's things going security-wise? I mean, you enjoying it? You still love the tech? Me, yeah. I mean, it's still super passionate. Like, I, I can't see myself personally going into another field. I know a few years ago, um, I had an opportunity to, you know, potentially go work at Netflix. And it was just for a while I was thinking like, oh, it'd be really cool to go work a place where people have actually heard of like normal people, you know, like my grandmother, she knows what Netflix is, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but at the end of the day, I just think um, it just, it just fascinates me. Like being in security for as long as I have, I just don't, can't see myself doing anything else. But what, you know, so, so here we go. Let's, let's talk about Tenable. I know I, I guess we one day pull in a meet, but we've been there a long time, actually longer than a meet, right? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So everybody thinks that Tenable is a, a one-stop shop, right, as far as vulnerability scanners. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not true. So I'll give you – let's give a little break. So how many different products do you have right now? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we have a whole portfolio of products. Um, we have, obviously, a lot of different products that do different sorts of assessment. Um, and then we have two different enterprise sort of platforms, an on-prem one uh, and then a cloud-based one. Um, I, like with our cloud-based product, we have a few offerings like container security related stuff, um, yeah. trying to move more into the DevOps space, uh, web application sort of uh, scanning. And Tenable just acquired a uh, in OT products like in December, it closed. So um, we had started trying to build one of those products in house, but it just, you know, when you're in the enterprise, you have to have best in class to kind of do that and realized it was better worth the time and investment into buying best in class. So they acquired Indigy and so far that's been really good. So, yeah. And, and at the end of the day, like the problem that we're trying to solve with 
it's not just vulnerabilities and getting a list of CVEs and, hey, go patch this. It's, it's really trying to give, you know, our customers the visibility, kind of like where they're exposed. And, you know, we've, we've introduced something called Lumen um, mid last year. We're trying to quantify risk. We look at different things of like what's installed on an asset. We have a huge data science team now. I started that team probably four or five years ago and took a lot of a long time to like really do enough research to be able to try to quantify the value of assets based on the data we're pulling back. And then came up with a pretty cool uh, model that uh, can predict the likelihood of an exploit based on the sort of vulnerability that's out there. And then you start tying that together. It's more, it helps with the prioritization, you know? So what we're looking at, and part of my job now is like, where do we go next? Like, how do we continue to expand what it is that we do? Um, I mean, there's so many things out there that kind of lend uh, to us being like an exposure company and the visibility that goes with that. So yeah. it's pretty exciting. So would, would Lumen have picked up the big Citrix um, access gateway vulnerability that occurred? Um, no, not, it, it, it doesn't, not in the sense of, of like, predicting zero days or predicting that sort of thing. Um, and I don't, I mean, I haven't, like I said, I just came back two weeks ago. So with the Citrix thing in particular and where we were with being able to, to look at that particular vulnerability, I just, I don't know. Um, but it's more along the lines of looking at what's going on in the wild with some of these vulnerabilities, um, what's being said and stuff, and then a model that gets applied to that. So I don't know. And, uh, in particular to that one. So I suspect that your research team spends a hefty amount of time surfing the dark web, mm -hmm. looking for interesting conversations and attacking. Yeah, there's a lot of that. There's so, a lot of different factors. And we even started pulling in some open source, like there's a lot of data out there, you know, that's available, yeah. that's open source. So we try to leverage as much information as we can to help give context to, you know, some of the, the likelihood that some of these vulnerabilities sure. will actually get exploited. And, and as a part of the product and the offering, you know, we, we try to work that in as a way for people to help like prioritize where they're going to, you know, what, what steps they should take to like legitimately minimize the risk in their environment versus, right. you know, historically with old school vulnerability management, you just look at CVSS scores. It's like, well, 10, I guess that's bad. So let me just get a list of all of the CVSS 10 vulnerabilities and you get this huge list of, and then yeah. go patch and everybody's like, Jesus, that's so much work. You know, it's just, it's very reactive, just very like, it's just a pain in the ass, honestly. So the approach that we're trying to take <clears> is <throat> to how do we empower our customers to legitimately minimize their risk? Like where can they, uh, where, which areas in their environment should they go address to, you know, try to, try to handle that. How how do you guys uh, how are you guys or what is your if you can speak about it your uh, strategy is staying number one with uh, Rapid Seven and Qualys you know some of those other fringe players making their entrance into the uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant how is Tenable able to remain the the market leader in the space in the vulnerability risk management space yeah um, that's a good question I mean. Yeah, I'm, of course, I'm biased to, to Tenable, of course, but, it, you know, Rapid7 and Qualys, they, they do some good things. Um, I mean, I, I think when you just look at what we're trying to achieve and how over the course of our history, we've always been focused, like, where our investment is, like, the effort that we put in from an R&D perspective and the problems we try to solve has always been around that that cyber hygiene, cyber exposure, like vulnerabilities, asset, you know, trying to get arms around that. If you look at the strategy of, you know, some other players in the space, you know, some of the adjacencies that they've gone into, they've kind of, you know, they've gone in multiple different directions. So I think it's just, you just look at the investment that we've made to solve this problem and be best in class. We've doubled down where, where we've, you know, where people, or for the reasons why people have, come to us historically. Yeah. 
So, so Glenn, you're talking about like uh, at one point you brought up CVE, and mm -hmm. obviously Tenable and the Nessus scanner is around vulnerability, but a lot of people are talking about minor attack, right? We just talked about with that board last week, right? With Mike Jenks, we were talking about uh, MITRE attack and the use of MITRE attack in operational analysis. And, and obviously the MITRE attack is more about how do we handle detection and how do we understand the understanding of how one thing leads to another, while CVE has always been about a weakness or vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. So is Tenable changing any of their lingo or marketing around MITRE attack or are you consistently still embracing the CVE type of model? No, we're, we're definitely trying to expand past that. Like if you, I mean, if you just go to our website, we, we call ourselves like the cyber exposure company and some of the stuff that we've, and that means something. It's not like we just made up some words and be like, oh, this is what we do now. Like we've legitimately <laughs> tried to, uh, to really kind of follow up with the East Coast company. East Coast yeah. company actually yeah. care, right? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we've introduced like things where how do we, we quantify a an environment's like hygiene because if you look at like if and a lot of people like to focus on APTs and all these crazy state sponsored attacks the majority of people to get exploited it's over really dumb reasons it's you know it's mm -hmm. just common sense basic hygiene that like if companies did that like 99% of the stuff would go away so a lot of what we've tried to do from an exposure standpoint all that is based on our ability to you know, get visibility and a lot of different things. And like I said, it's more than just CVEs and just asset related information. We have a lot of plugins and things that connect to systems of record. There's like just a lot of data that we can pull yeah. about what's running in there. How, how can we not only what we've done to date, but continually give our customers an idea of how well their hygiene is in place, like doing the basics and doing that sort of stuff. So when, you know, it tying right back to like MITRE and those sort of things, we've, we've really started discussing like how do we tie some of the stuff we do to a lot of these different like frameworks and just lines of thinking and like how, do, like how do we make it easier for people to speak a common language, do the basics and do that sort of stuff. And um, so, yes, I mean, us just like everybody else, we have ways to go um, in some of these things, but yeah, we, we are definitely moving away from just, being a company like Nessus 20 years ago of here's a 60 page PDF with 10,000 CVEs. Like that's not actionable and that doesn't necessarily, but it definitely doesn't tie back to legitimate risk or how your business is doing securing itself. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you talk about just, yeah, I was yeah. just saying, Glenn, to support, you know, some of those facts that you were talking about, uh, the on the Internet Society Online Trust Alliance, in, in addition with working with the FBI, when they went back and did a complete analysis of 2018 breaches, they stated very emphatically that 95% of all breaches could have been prevented. And it, it ties back to a lot of that, that uh, simple stuff that really is mundane and, and gets overlooked a lot of times. Oh, I'll do it later uh, kind of things. Yeah, it's... It's, it's crazy. Even like I've just over the years, this isn't even a new thing. Like you go and, you know, I, sometimes I'd get asked to go talk to existing customers or help try to close a big deal. And people are always worried about APTs and all this crazy stuff. It's like nobody, like I wouldn't worry about that if I were you just do the basics. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's crazy to me. And so you're talking about like at one point, Glenn, you were talking about like how Tenable has changed and, in the 20 years, you know, it's been around. One of the questions I would have gone to is, obviously MITRE attack, you've had chances, or you've had the chance to, from an engineering perspective, to, to get ready for it. Mm -hmm. So we have this COVID-19 going on right now, right? And the pandemic has changed the mode of operation, not just for the government, but for every company out there. And so now we're seeing a ton of, and Jeremy will just tell you the same thing, we're seeing tons of EDR platforms out there. We're seeing more SD-WAN, stay-at-home users, uh, mobile services, right? Web services. How does that huge change in infrastructure change the way Tenable looks at its customers? I mean, does Tenable mm -hmm. have this, forget the marketing guys, because the marketing guys jump on everything. 
right? I know that you're <laughs> you're a good geek, and you probably <laughs> sat with a bunch of other people, right? And you're saying, man, people are really screwed. What is Tenable doing for this change of operation? Like, is there a, a move internally saying, man, we really got to learn how to scan VP, you know, over VPCs or you know over VPNs, and we've got to go really after these services, like all these people have services, maybe we can create a, a web service health check to go after this kind of stuff. I mean, what's, is, is Tenable beginning to say, listen, I've got to get used to this new infrastructure with COVID-19, is there a movement? I mean, what's happening in the back end? Yeah, um, so historically, you know, we, we've actually, we, we've had this Nessus agent for years at this point, um, and we, it actually, it started for trying to address like credentials. Like we, we were seeing the number of people that were just doing scans of like uncredentialed scans and the sort of data you can get when you're just doing port scanning versus credentialed scans. It's just not as good, obviously. So, and, and one of the you know historical issues with that is like, well, I don't want to give my credentials up. Which, okay, we get it. Um, so we're like, well, what happens if we could figure out a way to run the Nessus engine locally on every machine so that you didn't need credentials. So this was like three or four years ago. Um, right. And it was, it's interesting. I didn't expect that to take off as much as it has. Um, and it's interesting to see over the last few months, like you could just look at our metrics and the number of agent deployments because so many people aren't sitting in the office now, they're being dispersed. So the ability to still get the visibility that people were getting when everybody was co-located in different offices, they're still able to see it um, in, uh, in, a, uh, in a remote kind of workforce like this because the Nessus agent is there. And, and on top of that, just a lot of ways, just from, you know, we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, sort of the portfolio of products and just the different stuff we have. We don't just scan. Like we have a lot of different services with our Tenable IO product where how we interface with you know, AWS and Azure and those sort of things where it's all service-based sort of things and how we query APIs, the data that we pull back and the sort of visibility you can get into what's running in different environments completely independent of actually running scans. So the, one of the big reasons why, this is probably five or six years ago that we, you know, historically Tenable was always on-prem. And mm -hmm. one of the big reasons why we said, look, you know, we were growing, you know, business was great, but we we're like, we need to move to the cloud because a lot of the things that we wanted to do. Yeah, it was. I hired a couple of graphical guys from a competitor. You guys had a really good push on the cloud, right? You yeah. guys are very solid. Yeah. And I, you know, I was, I was running engineering at the time and I could tell you trying to juggle building a brand new cloud product. And at the time I had zero engineers with distributed scan, like distributed systems capabilities and while trying to maintain the existing stuff and the growth, it was, it was a, Definitely an interesting time for me professionally to juggle all that, but we did it. And the reason why we did it is we knew strategically a lot of the things that I just touched on. The only way we were going to be able to do that is if we were in the cloud, not only just from a scale perspective, but being able to write different types of services, like what you can interact with, how you can scale, like what you can do just completely changes the game when you're not completely reliant on people deploying things. And so yeah. that move you know, five years ago, the decision it was five or six years ago at this point, it's yeah. really helped us be able to do some of the stuff that we're able to do in an environment like we're in now. So um, by the way, I'm going to switch over to overtime. I'm going to switch over to my Japanese water, my <laughs> Asahi water, because Aquinas, <laughs> I don't even think this stuff has alcohol in it. I think they, the Japanese pretend that they have alcohol in their beer. Anyway. <laughs> So, uh, so, yeah, go on, Jeremy, bro. Tenable OT. Yeah, that's uh, it's, it's probably your most new, your newest product. Tell us about what does that. OT stand for offensive o technology. Operational technology. Uh, Operation. It's ICS based. Yep. Yeah. Well, PCL is ICS. That sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So it was you know formally Indigi, um, yeah. one of the leaders in the space. Um, I am actually just getting really up to speed with some of their stuff now. I was playing a lot with their technology actually the last two days. Um, it's a huge, like untapped market. You know, I, I mean, it's, I remember during our time with Chris, when Chris and I worked together at McAfee, 
uh, we had DOE was one of the biggest, one of our bigger customers for the product that we kind of worked with. And it was just interesting, the, like what I had learned from dealing with the DOE at the time of how just crazy our, you know, that OT sort of world is on still running things like Windows NT, you know, and software written forever and nobody touches it because it's running like don't sneeze don't look at it don't do anything so you know how how do you how do you secure and how do you ensure that like a critical part of our like national secure like our infrastructure is, is secure so we knew when we looked at the whole like from a strategy perspective we do an amazing job of like it assets right like scanning your traditional it and even the cloud like we have since moving to the cloud ourselves, like how much we've worked with, you know, Azure, AWS and those sort of stuff, bringing those sort of assets. The reason why we have container security is trying to move a little bit further left. So like when it came to that kind of traditional stuff, we have really solid coverage. The one thing that we felt like we, we definitely didn't have, and you know, it was just a spot that just had so much potential um, was the, the OT world. And, like I said, we, we tried to build it in house and it just <laughs> made more, like it was, it's a tough problem to solve. Like it's really <laughs> tough. <laughs> yeah. Do, Another topic. You guys uh, must have a, you must have a great lab where you got all kinds of toys like this to play with. Well, that was a part of the problem. Like it's very expensive. Like those, that, that gear is super expensive. So like what we were trying to do it was, it was limited, you know, now I know like the, the 10 below T team, like the old energy folks, uh, I haven't made it over to Israel yet to see it obviously, but um, I heard like their, their setup is legit. Like the, like what you can play with in the head and their environment is, is pretty cool. So I am actually, once we are able to leave the house, head over there and kind of start playing with that stuff. But um, yeah, that, I mean, that was one of our problems. We just, to do it right requires just a lot of that hardware and it's not cheap and it was yeah it's it's a tough it's tough to get in there but when you it's do tough. it's yeah. yeah yeah it's yeah and if you don't have natively the uh the ICS system yeah. experience that makes it even yeah. more difficult especially when you don't have the gear to play with you're just working yeah. with simulators and that's yeah that can be dicey sometimes and think like we were doing some some decent things. It's not like it was a complete waste. Like we, we we would do a a good enough job in certain areas, like certain like a different detection. Like we'd be able to say, hey, you know, these are the different sort of you know OT sort of devices you have running and and doing that sort of stuff all passively. But then the the vulnerability piece, like all of the other things that kind of go with it, it was just it just made more sense from an investment perspective to people that already have best in class, like, yeah, it just, it's just snatch it up. Yeah. Own the market space. Yeah. Is there any of the uh, tenable developed code that made it into the tenable OT or is it a complete rebrand? Um, well, from a sensor perspective of what they do again, like I, I'm pretty sure this is the case. I'm just newly back. Like what they do is still all of them, but the idea is how do we bring that data back into our enterprise products? Like how do we tie the I, like visibility into IT and OT together with our you know secure yeah. tenable.sc product and tenable.io product, and then with the Lumen and then being able to quantify the risk and all the data science stuff. So all of that will be tenable related, but like the detections are like what they're doing to do what they do best we should probably let them do what they do best and not mess with that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Smart. You know, you go through all the OT Very stuff cool. and stuff, and, but I mean, obviously business is business. I mean, being back at Tenable and seeing what they're doing and you must be reinvigorated. I mean, it is good to take a t- sabbatical. I think yeah. everybody needs to take a sabbatical. I took a complete year off between Mac and Fluency, right? It's, just such a nice thing to re-gauge yourself. Now, you're back there, you're loving it. You know, as we get, because I'm kind of in overtime, I'm already halfway through my, my Japanese stuff here, is, I mean, what, what's your big pitch right now in Tenable? If you said, this is what I really love, like, I feel marketing 
really screws the pooch on explaining this. If mm -hmm. people really understood what was going on, this is the, what they would love about Tenable, right? I mean, right now, what is the thing, because we know how marketing works. Marketing ruins <laughs> the reality. It's worse than fake news. It ruins the reality of what's really happening. And so my point is, <laughs> at Tenable, what is the, the, the part at Tenable where you feel like, I wish people would realize that this term is wrong and that this is what they should be looking at and this is probably the biggest impact to their business. Yeah, I, I do wanna, marketing is, is not the devil. Like we, I, I actually, I, I have a lot of uh, respect for the marketing team at, at Tenable. They, um, like one of the things that I, I missed being away and I'm, I'm glad and you know, there's a lot of things on, you know, but genuinely speaking, everybody at, at Tenable market, like everybody's trying to do the right thing, like work together for the most part, obviously there's politics of people or people, you know, but generally speaking, like everybody is trying to do the right thing, which is why I'm, I love being there. Um, but to answer your question, um, I think security is a is a hard problem for sure, but we kind of touched on it earlier. I think we spend we just the population um, spend too much time and money and effort on doing things that aren't really the basics. Like if, if we really just simplified what we needed to do to secure our environment, like the amount of attacks would drastically go down. And I don't know if it's when you go to like RSA and Black Hat and all these different shows and you have a million different vendors out there and there's a million different ways to solve the same different problem, just a little bit different. Like it could be overwhelming, but like for like non-technical people like to, you know, like when you're just, just being bombarded by sales calls and marketing material and all that, but it's really, it should be the basic blocking and tackling. And if we can somehow push that narrative just do the basics, it would help so many people. Like it doesn't require, you know, craziness. I, I think you're really outlining why the Capitals won the Stanley Cup. It's because they focused <laughs> on the Ovechkin was no longer the Ovechkin show yeah. and they focused on the basics of the team and they were able yep. to just play hockey while everybody else was trying to play some other game. Yeah, I think I agree with that 100%. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. We say you're welcome. Yeah. You, you know, listen, that is a wonderful atmosphere, incredible fans. It's one of my favorite places. I went to, I've been to a number of arenas. Considering that the year I went there, it was like the fifth or sixth, I guess it was like the 12th game, it was Buffalo. What a wonderful place. What a wonderful place. This was before they rallied around after the shooting. It, it, what a wonderful place and, and great team. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's almost like hockey is beautiful in the sense that people do get their chance. And Ovechkin had his chance, and, and he didn't miss it. And he was wonderful. And, but, yeah, I, I was very – I loved Vegas. The, the Vegas team, I still love. One day, I hope to win the cup. I really do. I really do. But I they will against them because yeah. I really want the Caps to win. I I was so tired of getting the rally rags in the Caps yeah. and spin it and just calling them, you know, to wipe up my tears at the end of the, the season. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> nice yeah, yeah. Some win. My my wife and I went out to Vegas for games one and two of the Stanley Cup, and because we've had season tickets to the Caps for. 12 years at this point, 14 years. It's been a long time. Um, Great seats, by the way. And uh, so we went out for games one and two, and we were at the game for – and then for game five, we were contemplating going out to Vegas. But I was like, no, they're going to win it in game five. I want to be I want to be downtown celebrating with everybody. So we were oh, we were, down, we were at the Verizon Center in game five. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I did a stupid family function. I could have been there. But yeah. Yeah, it was it was wild. I've never seen that many people just elated, like the whole city. Like it was it was just yeah, one of the most awesome. So, nights so, ever. so your your little boy who has yet to run around, he was conceived. You might see him. Which game? 
when we beat the penguins. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my, been, I was married 15, 16 years. We didn't think my wife could have kids. But this is no joke. Like, we just kind of gave up, you know. And we beat the penguins, and um, two miracles happened. <laughs> no <laughs> joke. <laughs> so, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna crack into my uh, yes. Sierra Nevada like nursing this fantastic summer. haze Imperial IPA because we're talking about hockey now. Yeah, that was you, are, you know, I've got this bottle of Dogs Ridge wine that I've saved for the moment that Glenn and I are going to hang out here and drink. Maybe you can bring your little boy over here yeah. and he can go swimming in the pool and we can, we can finally open that sucker up. All and right. then I'm going to go to Vanish and we're going to hang around Vanish. I mean, I, I keep on bringing that place up. That is like the, the it's like Duff beer. It's like this Disneyland effect. It's got a playground. And yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. That's pretty cool. It's, it's a yeah. cool spot. Yeah, it's, it's good. I mean, like I said, Loudon is the place. And that's the reason why I'm surprised you only have Guinness in your house. Um, oh, well, Glenn, I mean, I'm always happy to see you. You look really good. I mean, me, yeah. I look like pale. I'm like, white as could be. I got to <laughs> I gotta find a better camera or something. It's because I don't believe that. <laughs> you know? You need some self-tanner. I, you know what? I mean, like Trump or something. I, would just be, I should be orange. <laughs> 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 It's a, it's beautiful. I mean, it's cold out there right now. But it's it beautiful. is cold. Uh, you know, I was talking to my daughter, and we were agreeing that COVID nineteen is making people live like us, because because I'm a a cleat. Yeah. I love my solitude. This Zoom is normal for me. This is this is my life. I, I can't believe people yeah. are saying that they they can't wait for it to be over. I mean, this is good. This is this is the way it should be. Yeah, I, I'm I'm normally very like I don't like to go out and see people like I'm pretty much a homebody. But the fact that I can't go out makes me want to go out. Like I'm just the yeah. For me, or cap games because I really wanted to go see cap game. I was gonna hang. You know, what I was gonna buy tickets for Glenn. I was thinking about you because you do you have the indoor tickets for uh, uh, the football. I was like, gonna buy some defender tickets. I was gonna call you up and go see the defenders and like they yeah. came. I'm like ah, this is just not right. This is the universe against us right now. Yep. But um, uh, when you uh, w- w- when your little guy gets big enough, you're gonna have him play hockey. Yes, he already has little gloves and a little just, stick. And that's yeah. a, such a given. That's yeah. such a given. And the funny thing is, like for Northern Virginia, it's a hockey town. Like Ashburn has a beautiful rink. It's packed all the time. It, it is a hockey town around here. I mean, it's it's. It's been a hockey town for a while. Like the caps are always packed. They're always good. You know, even before Ovechkin, it was a well loved team, right? Ovechkin is, but Ovechkin is <clears throat> quality as a human being in the universe. Yeah. Just absolutely quality. I can't go into so many great stories about him. Anyways, um, I guess we got to talk eventually about security as we wrap it up. So uh, <laughs> we're going to have you back. We're going to figure if anybody even listens to this shit. We're going to still have you back. Okay. So um, I don't even know how you answer. So what, what, what is people should be doing with Tenable right now? What is the product that they should buy? And what, what, or what, how, what, could, how could Tenable or how could Tenable help the COVID-19 work from home situation? Well, that's the, that was the beginning part, right? How do you yeah. change to handle that? You talked about the agents. You talked about ready for the cloud. Yeah. Just, well, we, we've actually gave uh, free licenses out for people for a set amount of time of our tenable, like our cloud product and agents. You like, told me it could have been free? It's free. And just for, it's like three and a half grand. For, for a certain amount of time. Like eventually we, we <laughs> I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know the time. I think it's for like a, a month or two. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, we wanted to, to be as much of a service to people as possible, especially in, in this kind of hard time. Um, yeah. I mean, honestly. So to go back to it, what you feel is, I'll paraphrase it and you correct me. You feel that stop looking at how everything changed and ask yourself, what are the simple things you should be doing? Mm-hmm. Train your employees, 
patch your systems, right? Check your vulnerability, see your status, and build it from there. Yeah, and it's not, it's obviously vulnerabilities, obviously knowing what you have to secure, like the basic sort of stuff, um, but it's also password related stuff, like things just outside of our mm -hmm. core competency. It's, it's all of the basics. Um, and the basics are the basics, regardless if you're sitting in an office or sitting at home. Right. And if, and if you keep, if, if like, regardless with the, the current state of the world, if people, like if security teams continue to focus on the basics, you simplify like what you need to, uh, you know, what you should be focusing on. It's just. Let me put you on the hot seat. Let okay. me give you three options. LastPass, UBT, or Duo Security. Which one are you going to choose for your, your company? Duo. You're a Duo man. You I mean, I, I use LastPass too. It's, I mean, if I had to pick one, like if I had to prioritize them, I use LastPass and Duo. I mean, 2FA, like you, I mean, that, again, that's, those are basics. Those are things that you should be doing. Um, password managers and stuff are great. Like it's definitely uh, useful when people use them right because you can you can get no value out of that if you're still using. Yeah, Duo sweet. I mean, we we support Duo. I like Duo. So one of the first things we put in, I couldn't get my customers to use it. We pulled it out, and then lo and behold, we had ECS Federal who said, "Hey, Chris, can you put Duo in there?" It literally was just overnight. It was just grabbing the branch, merging it back in. It was like, thank God someone wants to use Duo. I mean, I think Doug, it Doug donated like a million dollars to the some COVID-19 stuff. I mean, he, COVID-19, he has been, Doug's been a, a sweet dude. I mean, you're talking about a community that nobody cares about, the security community. And there's just a lot of, a lot of really caring people in this industry. So, okay, so, so Duo Security is what you want. All right, what, what about, Jeremy, how do you want to wrap this up? Because obviously you're wearing your Vegas hat, and so... I'll give you the <clears throat> Yeah, well, my 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 embarrassment to the you know, actually I was on the fence with that right, that whole series because my son is actually the the Knights fan. And I've actually been an Ovechkin fan. Yes. And when Justin Williams went to the Caps, we became yeah. even more reason to be a Caps fan. That said, thank you, Glenn, <laughs> for uh spending some time drinking some beers and uh I think it's been fun. It's been definitely an a, a educational experience. Hopefully our audience, when we get one, we'll get something out of this. <laughs> uh, learning a little bit more, more about Tenable and uh, its product line. So thank you for your time today. Yeah, appreciate it. It's been great. Al, you've been nice and quiet. You have like well, a halo not... with that Federation thing around your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to. You got to get him a mask. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, thank you. I think, you know, everything that, that the industry is doing together for uh, cybersecurity is ever so critical. You know, you, some of the latest headlines are that the ransomware hackers are particularly aggressive right now around the healthcare industry, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's things that we all can do together to help protect our way of life, right? And, and our freedoms in this country that I think are very important. And thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for your service. And scene. <laughs> <laughs>